Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, once again, <clears throat> this is your true worshiper, the watchman. As you know that I only minister this word to believers. And I am not, you know, ignoring those that unbelieve, that don't believe. Excuse me. Hopefully, unbelievers are watching this channel. And my thing is with the unbeliever is to lead that unbeliever to Christ. Lead the unbeliever to Christ. And Jesus himself will tell you, will speak to the unbeliever. The power of God will come upon the unbeliever. And I pray that his soul will be saved. Amen. I want to talk to you about um, what you do with your time. And if you looked at the title, I wanted to say that if you have Given your time, your mind, your body, your last, your love to people who do not value you, to people who do not care about you. I want you to know today that you have done exactly what Jesus Christ did before he was crucified. That's right. Jesus had given all of his time to men and women who did not love him, who did not care about him, who could care less if he had a place to live, who could care less if he was thirsty, if he was hungry, if he was sick. They didn't even care. And he gave his all to people like that. And I know some of you out there today are in that same boat. You have, or do you, how do I put this? Do you feel that you have wasted your time, your years, your money, your youth, and your good health on people who do not care about you? Do you feel that you have wasted your feelings on people who do not value you? This is more common in relationships, marriages, boyfriend and girlfriend, parents with their children. A lot of parents feel that they have wasted their lives and their time giving their all to children who don't value them, don't respect them. Is anybody out there, am I talking to anybody out there that is living that right now or who has experienced that and you don't know what to do? And you don't know what to do because the love that you have in your heart you didn't make yourself this way. You're not a damn fool as people have said you are because you keep loving people who don't care. So you're called a damn fool. Mm -hmm. You're not a damn fool. What you are is a child of God. 
in what you are doing, you are imitating Christ. The Bible tells us to imitate Christ. Amen. So you're not being a fool. But it's time for you to be set free. Okay? You can't continue on doing this. Jesus did it for three years. And he did say he's going to do even greater things than he did. And some of you have been loving those who do not love you. You have been valuing others who do not value you for 20 and 30 years. 15 to 17 years. 5 to 10 years. And when Jesus walked this earth, he did it for three years. Mm-hmm. And even God had mercy and said, son, it's time to go. But you don't have to die to get out of this situation where you are throwing your pearls to swines, caring for ungrateful children, sons and daughters who don't love you at all. Wives who are using you and you're the husband and you value this woman, but she doesn't value you. Husbands who are taking their wives for granted. The wife values the husband, but the husband doesn't value the wife. It shows. You can walk into their house. You know the man, the husband makes a lot of money. And when you walk into his home, you don't see anything, no pictures on the wall. You don't see a washing machine or dryer. His wife is a stay-at-home mom. He won't even buy a washing machine and dryer. She has to load the clothes up, tie them up in the sheet, catch the bus with laundry, ask a neighbor to give her a ride to the laundromat. And if you're in the South, they call the laundromat the washateria. But I want to talk to you about what do you do after you find out that you have been giving your time and your feelings to people who do not value you whatsoever. What do you do? I want to talk to you about what Jesus had to do, what Jesus did. And I want to let you know that what's going on with you is not strange. Even Jesus said this. He says, don't feel bad that they hate you, for they hated me first. Don't feel bad that they're using you, because they use me first. Don't feel bad and want to just throw in the towel and commit suicide, because they hate you and they persecute you, because they hated me and persecuted me first. And then he says, don't throw in the towel. For behold, I have overcome the world. I overcame every last one of those haters. I overcame depression. I overcame anxiety. I overcame stress. There was a time when Jesus was, it was like six days before the Passover. And um, he was healing people, people who were blind, people who were paralyzed, um, people who were deaf, people who were just sick with, with whether it was the flu, cancer, AIDS, 
a woman bent over um, with endometriosis. Yes. And he healed her. Lepers, people with leprosy. He was six days before the Passover. He's doing all this. And then on the Sabbath day, he finds a man that's paralyzed and he heals him. And the church leaders, the church leaders, not the Roman soldiers, not Hitler's army, um, not ISIS, not terrorists. These were church leaders. Mm -hmm. Leaders that believed in God, that believed in Abraham, that believed in the laws of Moses. These church leaders wanted to kill Jesus because he was healing people. And he was healing people on the Sabbath day. Okay? And one of the laws says that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Uh huh. And these church leaders wanted to kill Jesus because he was doing his father's work. Because he says his father is always working. And you can read that in John chapter John chapter 6, I believe. John chapter 6. Or John chapter 5. Yeah, John chapter 5. Verses 26, 25. John chapter 5 and John chapter 6. Jesus tells them that he does what he sees his father's doing. His father's always working, so he's working. Amen. Jesus not going to let a holiday or a special day stop him from saving somebody's life. But the church leaders who claim they knew more than God and that they knew God better than Jesus, they wanted to kill Jesus because Jesus was healing people. On the Sabbath day. Now. After Jesus is doing all these healings. And he got away from the. Church leaders that wanted to kill him. He slipped away. He um, went to the other side of Galilee. And he went to a mountain. And the crowd was looking for him. And when they found him, there was uh, about 5,000 of them. And they had traveled so far because they had seen all the healings that Jesus was doing, the miracles that he was performing. They themselves wanted to be healed. So about this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. And they had five loaves of bread and two fishes. Now these loaves of bread are not like the loaves of bread that you buy at Walmart or Smith's or the dollar store. These loaves of bread, they look like vanilla wafers. They were round, about the size of a vanilla wafer. Okay? And they had two fish. And Jesus asks Philip, what do we have to feed these people? And when Philip looks at these five vanilla wafer-sized pieces of bread and the two fish, he says to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, there's going to take a year's wages to feed all of these people. Jesus says, tell the people to sit down. Sometimes you have to sit down when there's not enough. When you don't have enough, that's when God tells you to 
sit down. Are you listening? When you're at your wit's end and you have been valuing people who do not value you, you have been loving those who do not love you, you have been kind to those who won't even be kind to you. You have been mindful and thoughtful of family members and family members are not even being thoughtful of you. You are being mindful and thoughtful of your husband and your husband's not being mindful or thoughtful of you. You have been mindful and thoughtful of your wife and your wife is not being mindful or thoughtful of you. When you are at your wit's end, <coughs> And you see all that you have, and it's just not enough to go any further. That's when it's time to sit down. That's when God tells you, are you listening, friend? Sit down. God tells us in times like this, when we are afraid, and we are surrounded and overwhelmed by the enemy. That's when Jesus says, be still. Now God is about to perform a miracle. Amen. So he tells the 5,000 people, sit down. And he begins to pass five loaves of bread. And two fishes to the people. But before he does that, he takes the bread and he breaks it. And he looks up to heaven and he asks that his father, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that sent him to us to bless this bread. And the father does it. And then Jesus says, now feed these people. And they pass that basket around. Now the fish, the fish were the size of sardines. And as that basket was being passed around to 5,000 people, it never emptied. It never emptied. Every time someone grabs some bread and grabs some fish, it never emptied. It stayed full. Matter of fact, there was so much that they had leftovers. So I want you to know today, children of God, that you have poured into other people and no one has poured into you. Today, you have found out that there is one that will pour into you. Right now, he's pouring into you. You were empty, but he's pouring into you. Because Jesus has lifted you up and asked God to bless you. Yes, he has. He has lifted you up and asked God, ask the Father to bless you. See, you were empty. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how far you were going to go. Matter of fact, let's read John chapter 6, verses 51 through 71. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with that. John chapter 6, starting at the 51st verse. Let's see what it says. That light has got me blinded. Oh. I can't see. 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats the bread <clears throat> will live forever. <clears throat> the bread is my flesh in which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the Father, just as the Father, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Many disciples deserted Jesus when they heard this. They said that this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? And what offended them was Jesus is saying that he's the bread and his blood is to drink. Now, we're not talking about cannibalism. Jesus is saying that I believed my father. And if you are going to eat this bread and drink this blood, that means that you must believe in me. Jesus was talking to them about believing his words and believing that he was sent from God. Okay, that's how you eat the bread of life. That's how you drink his blood, by believing that God sent him. And then it says, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning, watch this, for Jesus has known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. From the beginning, he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12, yet one of you is a devil. And he was talking about Judas Iscariot, the one that later would betray Jesus. Even Jesus said that, haven't I chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And guess what? God took care of that devil. And a lot of you have chosen people in your circle in your lives to love, to value, to show kindness to. And you probably have chosen 
a devil just like Christ did. But God is telling you, just be still. Just sit down. I'm going to take care of that devil. I'm going to separate you from that devil. I'm going to get that devil out of your life. And when I get that devil out of your life, I'm going to send my ministering angels. See, when Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the devil, what did Jesus say? The last thing Satan told him to do was to use his anointing to turn stones into bread, to bow down to the devil, and he would give him all of these luxuries. And you know what Jesus said? He says, get away from me, Satan. Get away from me, Satan. And when Jesus said that, the Bible says God sent legions of ministering angels to minister to Jesus, to serve Jesus, to take care of every last one of his needs. And I'm going to say to you that are listening, right now, Satan, I bind you. Get away from them, Satan. Get away from that wife. Get away from that husband. Get away from those parents. Right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for sending those ministering agents, angels right now to destroy the agents of Satan. Thank you, Lord. I see that mother being set free. I see that father being set free. I see the girlfriend being set free. I see the husband being set free. I see wives being set free. I see children being set free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I see the angels pouring, whoo, filling their cups with gladness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah with joy, with happiness. Thank you, Lord, for the relief. Thank you for your word, God. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The devil has been walking with you longer than he walked with Jesus. Uh-huh. That's right. Judas walked with Jesus for three years. And some of you have Judas's in your family. It's been walking with you for 20 years, for 10 years, been in your marriage for a long time. But the Bible said that Judas hung himself. Hallelujah. He got away from Jesus and hung himself. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. I bind every Judas right now. Every trouble that's been attached to you for so many years. 